Hello and welcome to Own It If I Want To. My name is Andrea Mowry and this is a weekly podcast where I try my best to answer some of your knitting, fiber arts sorts of questions. And I'm just making sure I have everything we need for today's questions. So today I am wearing my newly released Traveler Cowl. I had so much fun with this stitch with the original Traveler, with the Traveler shawl, with the shawl, that I just couldn't stop. And I also know that some people aren't shawl people. They want something that's a little easier to pop on, that they don't have to figure out how to wrap it around them. And so this is one of my favorite styles of cowl. I started with this style back with the shift in like, oh, it would have been six years ago. Wow, the shift is like six years old next month. Um, so, Anyways, this is a little triangle kind of bandana style cowl that is just so easy to wear. It's easy to pop on with any outfit and it plays so well with the stitch pattern. I knit mine out of my hand spun and I had a goal with this pattern that I really wanted people to be able to use either their hand spun or odds and ends from their stash. I wanted you to be able to just dive in with what you had. Um, so what I did is I knit the first one, which is this one, and this is a DK weight yarn. And I had some leftovers from my rad plaid cowl, which is actually right over here behind me. I might as well show you what I'm talking about. So I had some leftover yarn from this cowl that I released last year. This is my other favorite style of cowl. So this is a Mobius or infinity cowl that is knit as a tube and you do one twist and you graft it together. Again, just so easy to pop on. I like mine to be kind of thick and squishy so that they keep me warm. So I had some leftover yarn from that that was closer to like a fingering or sport weight. So I wanted to see if I could knit the same pattern just using the dimensions and knitting to certain measurements so that I didn't have to rely on getting a certain gauge, so that I could just cast on, knit to a measurement, do the next step, and keep going. So that is, this is my second Traveler Cowl, and it worked. And I was so excited, because basically I want this pattern to be almost gaugeless. So I think it would work great with anything from fingering weight, well up to worsted, maybe even an Aran weight. Um, you could try a bulky. Once you start getting that thick, the only thing I would think about is you're going to need extra space around your neck because the yarn takes up space. So you would just want to be careful with sizing there. But the nice thing about pieces like cowls is they don't have to fit perfectly. You know, like they need to get over your head and they just need to be comfortable, but they can be bigger and slouchier. They can be a little tighter and snugger. Um, and so I thought it was a great pattern where you could bunch the gauge a little bit and it wouldn't be like oh no you've ruined it <laughs> like you can play around with it use up bits play around with like marling yarns holding multiple strands together using your hand spun I know a lot of you have gotten into spinning which makes my heart so happy because I love spinning as you probably all know by now and one of the really tricky things is figuring out what to knit with your hand spun. Because there's not a ton of patterns out there that are written specifically for hand spun. The good news is you can knit anything you want with your hand spun. You just have to find a pattern that works with the thickness of yarn you ended up spinning. But the great thing about the Traveler cowl or the Traveler shawl is it plays well with inconsistent yarn. So if your yarn's a bit thicker thin, your consistency is something you're still working on, it does great with that because it has these garter ridges. It also is perfect for the one or two special skeins of yarn you bought at that one festival or the one or two braids you bought, like maybe you're part of a fiber club. You could take two months, do a little combo spin, knit yourself a cowl. So I just think it's one of those great go-to projects that you can knit again and again and again. I also sized it for baby um, or toddler youth so big kid teenager and then small adult large adult and so you also have sizes to play with which you could also use um when you're kind of messing around with gauge and stuff but anyways i hope you love this pattern i'm so excited about it i mean i knit two back to back 
and I know it's going to be one of my projects like my Harlow hat or my DRK everyday socks that I'm going to return to time and again when I just need to knit something and I don't want to have to think too hard about what it's going to be um, and something that I know I'll use because even if I didn't wear it myself, I do have quite the cowl collection growing now. They make such great gifts. So I hope you love it as much as I do. And that is what I'm wearing today. This fiber is from Hello Yarn. It was a one of a kind. Oh, I love this colorway so much. Thankfully, I have two cowls out of it. Um, and I still have, I think, a little bit of the yarn left. Maybe I should make some cute little mitts or something. Um, but anyways, it is, I just love it. I would love if she dyed more fiber in a similar colorway because it's so beautiful. So let's do some questions. Question number one. If I'm using a superwash yarn for steaking and I want to do both a machine sewn and crochet reinforcement on the steaks, extra reinforcement, which one should I do first? So I do want to start this by saying you don't have to do both, but I have done both and I get it. I would start with the crochet reinforcement because it's going to be a lot harder to do that crochet reinforcement once you've already sewn through those stitches. The machine sewing will be enough. So if you decide to just do a couple lines of zigzag stitch on either side, you're going to be fine. But if you want to do both, I would do the crochet reinforcement and then I would zigzag over that crochet reinforcement. Um, but yeah, have fun. Good luck. I will tell you what. I think everyone should try steaking, even just on a swatch, just to try it because it unlocks potential. <laughs> it unlocks the fear. Like it, it makes you be like, oh my gosh, if I can cut my knitting, I can do anything. So if I were to develop a new class, the new class I would like to develop would be steaking because I just want everyone to try it because I think it just, yeah takes away some of that fear we have around getting sharp things near our knitting and it opens up a whole new world. I think there are a lot of people out there who do to being afraid of steaking. There's a lot of patterns that they're not going to try um, that they might really love. And so it's one of those things like, again, I say start with a swatch because that's going to take away the fear for you. Um, but it's also, it's just fun. I think it would be a fun class atmosphere to have everyone get in there with their scissors. Uh, but anyways, good luck with your steaking. I hope it goes so well and that you continue to steak many a cardigan or armhole or neck hole. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, my question is in your last episode, this actually a couple episodes ago, you showed your spindle spun skein, which is now up there and I lost my place. Ba, 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 da, ba. I know you had 18 different bobbins. So that's these little guys, uh, with the singles. And I'm wondering how you joined in new singles as each bobbin ran out. So I loved this question because we actually talked about it in my little knit spin group last night. So one of my friends was asking the same exact thing, like how did I manage adding in all the ends to this yarn when I was plying off of all of these? So it's actually quite easy, I think. Um, I think it is one of those things that once you do it, you're like, oh, this isn't so bad. I remember I've watched some classes where Quick, quick little detour here, but one reason besides spindle spinning that somebody might store fiber on a weaving bobbin is if they are doing a big old sweater spin with all one color, what they might want to do is break up all that yarn. Instead of having them on big bobbins, they put them on weaving bobbins because then when they go to ply, they can really mix those bobbins up so that as they're plying, they aren't just doing like this one whole bobbin, which maybe you were watching a crime drama and it got really intense and you start getting a little too thin because you were just like, oh my gosh. But then this one over this whole bobbin, you were just kind of loosey goosey, listen to some music, feeling good. And so now you have two bobbins that are gonna go together for the entire length and you might have a very different yarn when you then pull in bobbin number three to continue. So having all these little bobbins and mixing up all your singles is going to help you achieve what could be a more consistent yarn. So that would be another reason to store on little tiny bobbins. But I digress back to the question. So all I do is when I'm getting close to one of my little bobbins running out, 
I'm trying to find an end. I just saw one. For Pete's sake. I know I have one. There we go. I just kind of want to try and open up the ply. So if I was spinning, I'm going to try and keep my face. Uh, it wants to focus here. So what I do is you have all your plies and I'm holding them open with my hand. I'm just going to see if I can open this little guy up. And I do this when I still have an inch or two of my previous yarn. So I'm holding them all. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm letting them feed. Here, I'm going to do it on this hand, actually. So I'm letting it feed through my fingers like this, and you're plying. Swoop, swoop, swoop. So all I would do is I would take the tail of my new one and hold it with them. And if you actually kind of like open up past the twist a little bit and just slide the new one in there and then release, that twist will just kind of whoop, and eat it up and then you can just keep going so hopefully that doesn't sound super abstract but when you're doing it i think it'll make more sense but basically i just take that little that new little end here we go and pop it right in once as i was holding all those up pop it right in and then release and they'll just and twist right over that end and then i'll keep going from there so it's actually quite easy and i'll tell you what I don't think you'd be able to find in my two skeins anywhere where I joined. Um, so that's, that's how I do that. I am getting, question number three. I am getting ready to cast on for the Andrea cardigan. I have five skeins of worsted weight wool that is 100 grams to 200 yards. So a total of 500 grams, not the 511 called for for my size in the pattern. I can't order another skein of this yarn as it's currently out of stock and wouldn't be the same dye lot even if I could get it. I do have one skein of the same yarn in a contrasting color and I'm wondering if I can knit the pocket liners with that. Would it look weird? I really don't want to lose a game of yarn chicken. Okay, so some good news. If you are not making any modifications to that pattern, you should still have enough yarn. I always include a five to 10% bump of the yardage needed to cover things such as swatching, um, discrepancies between how you and I, we knit differently. Even if we knit the same style with the same yarn and the same needles, our knitting would still be different from each other because we're two different people. So I always give a little bump. So I think you're gonna be just fine and not even have to worry. But you can absolutely do different colored pocket liners. It can actually be a really cute little peekaboo effect. The only thing I would consider is you may want to have the top of the pocket that you could possibly see be in the sweater color that you're using. I don't know how contrasty your other skein is. If it's really similar, um, maybe kind of same color, just a different saturation, a little bit darker, a little bit lighter. I wouldn't worry too much about it, but let's say it's a totally different color. You might not want to always see that line of contrast when you're wearing the cardigan. Like if you were in a picture with a bunch of people and you're just seeing these two lines on the pockets, it could bother you. Maybe it won't. Maybe you're going to love that peekaboo effect. It's totally up to you and your personal style. Um, so, sorry, I realized I didn't like really read the rest of that question. I missed a sentence in the middle, but all it says is that you're a sucker for baubles, which I love. I'm a sucker for baubles too. Um, so yeah, if you're worried about that, and you don't want to see that, like it's your own special little thing that there is a different color liner in there. Just make sure that like the top half inch, one inch of your pocket liners is the color of your sweater. And that way, you're only using a little bit of your main color yarn to make sure and that way it'll match even if you can see inside your pocket a little bit. Um, but that's what I would recommend. Question number four, needs a drink of water. Okay. When I am choosing and knitting a sweater pattern, it's so helpful to see the photos of the designer in it, and it got me wondering. You have mentioned that your body runs a bit short in the yoke area, your shoulder to armpit distance. 
It sounds like you design the pattern with standard common body dimensions in mind, but when you make your samples that you're going to be wearing and that we see in the photographs of you, do you always make them exactly to the size mentioned in the pattern or do you make any adjustments so that it'll fit your body? For example, if you say you knit the yoke to eight and a half inches, then split for the sleeves, will that be exactly what you did for the one you're wearing, even if you make a slightly shorter yoke to fit your body better? So while I do have a short area, so when I've mentioned, what I've mentioned in the past is I seem to be short from my shoulder to like the top of my bust. And where I found issues with this is with bras. I cannot buy a fixed strap bra or tank or anything to save my life. It'll always fall off my shoulder because it's just too long. Um, that being said, I think I'm still of average length for actual yoke. So maybe I've got a long boob area <laughs> beneath that bit. I don't know. Um, so no, I don't do any special adjustments when it comes to that area. I, so what you see in the pattern is what I did. I don't stray from that. If anything, what I do is I try to offer tips. So where I'm more affected with sweater fit is my waist length, which is where I'm also very short. I have my, I, all my height is in my legs and then my waist is like, -da. so oftentimes I have been asked, why do you always knit like a crop sweater? I'm like, I don't, <laughs> that's full length on me. <laughs> But what might be full length on me might be cropped on you. So that's why I always include a note in pretty much all of my sweater patterns to knit to this length, which is the length I did, or your desired length minus this much for the hem. Because I know I'm short-waisted and that there are people who are going to prefer more length in the body. I think it's so personal and some of us vary so drastically in that area as far as how long we want something. So that's why I always try to put it in a pattern so that you can adjust it to the length you like. Um, but that was really thoughtful question. Uh, but yes, I am including what I've done in that pattern. I'm not doing a bait and switch on ya. Um, and I think if I ever did need to adjust anything there where I felt like it wouldn't fit on average most people hopefully well as well, I would note that in some way. Um, so yeah, there you go. By the way, side note on that is that is one of the things that is so great when any of you, if you ever are sharing about your own projects and you did make any modifications, it's so great to share those tips. I know for me, especially for sewing patterns. So I don't follow other people's knitting patterns anymore because I just have too many of my own ideas that I want to knit. Uh, but I do sew always patterns from somebody else. And that is one thing that I find so incredibly helpful. Usually before I do a sewing pattern, I will go check out that sewing patterns hashtag and I will go through all of the posts for that pattern and look for people that might have a similar body type to mine and see like there are designers that I've found they generally their pattern ones really big and people will be like size down at least two or three times and you'll see that consistently given that tip. So it's so appreciated when people share tips that they found helpful or like, oh, I have this one thing about my body and so to get it to fit me better, this is what I did. I love when as a community, we share those tips with each other because it can help all of us learn how to make clothes that better fit our unique bodies. All right, last question already. I treated myself to the traveler shawl pattern um, and I chose a fade that I love and working on the first tri triangle, I love the look. I am wondering, however, how to carry the fade into the second triangle since it is oriented differently. So the way that is why I grabbed these before the start of this episode. So the way that this shawl works is we have one triangle going in this direction and then we have another triangle going in this direction. So um, any suggestions? I was thinking of alternating my first two colors right away so that the contrast at the center spine would not be too stark. Also, considering a bind off of the first triangle 
as a two color eye cord, introducing one of my first two colors so that I can pick up the stitches with at least one of those colors. I am doing a four color fade and documenting on Ravelry. Um, so, so much fun. One thing, so a couple things. First of all, let me show you mine. So my second shawl, which is my bigger shawl, I think is a bit, a bit more cohesive um, all over in color. I think this one shows a bit more of the natural gradient that can happen in this hand spun yarn. So do you see that, how it kind of goes like dark to light with the blues? And then here it kind of does the same dark to light. So that would be one option is I would start your fade. Let's, I'm just gonna go with dark to light because it's an easy one to chat about. So let's say you went dark to light here. I think you can mimic that going that way. I don't think I would do the two color striped eye cord center spine unless you want that as a fun design element to it. Like you really like that stripey look. What is occurring to me is that if you choose to do that, you are adding a line of contrast into what is a blended fabric. So when we fade, our goal is to have as low of contrast as possible as we move from one color to the next. I think it's really fun and playful in that shawl to show the fade going in two directions. I would think of it as two different fades. Like they do not need to in any way line up on that center spine because what it's gonna do is this really magical effect of drawing your eye in two different ways. So I wouldn't fight that. Um, I would just pick, do I want to start it the same way? Do, if I end it on my light side with the big triangle, now do I wanna start on the light side and then go to dark? I think my first thought is to go dark to light, dark to light, kind of mimic it within the two triangles, but see how it's different because they're facing two different directions. Um, so that is my only thought about the two color I cord is then all of a sudden we're kind of going against what we're trying to achieve with our fade in that center spine. And it might look a little displaced in the overall fabric when you're done. When even those two fades, even if they're going in different directions, they're still going for the same thing. So it's okay if you have contrast bumping up along that big edge because you're, it's still gonna melt out. Um, and it's still gonna touch in on part of its own color, at least somewhere along that spine. So those are my thoughts. Um, you could even grab a little note card, draw two triangles next to each other and start playing with your own colors and kind of color it in and see what you like best before you get to that second triangle. Um, but happy belated birthday, by the way. And I hope that you love your shawl. All right. So I guess that's it. Have a great weekend. If you are interested in this new pattern, of course, it will be linked below along with a link if you want to ask any questions and happy making. Bye.